Welcome to the Thoughtful Gamer Podcast, episode number 66. As always, my name is Mark. Here with me today, we've got a lot of people. We've got Matt. It's uh, it's the great Mario Lemieux episode. I'd... It's fantastic. What? I, I'm not even going to ask. We have Orion. Yo. And we have the other Matt, who we call Bubba. Yeah, it's me. Mario then... Lemieux is a hockey player. Well, I know that. I just know the relevance <laughs> 66 in, oh is that his Raptors. number yes yes oh okay and then uh Another Lindsay's one. gonna join us <laughs> Lindsay's gonna join us sometime within the next few minutes and uh maybe i'll convince amber to join us and hop in and say something as well uh as she is currently nursing an ear infection over on the couch looking quite pained but maybe she'll have something to say this is a super fun episode, everybody. We are going to do three f- main things on this podcast. First, it's our our second Q&A podcast. I solicited questions. Uh, I got a lot of fun questions about various board game and non-board game things. So we're going to be answering a number of those questions. Secondly, we will be introducing our Masterpiece Games. This is something that I've been thinking about for a while of doing, and that is recognizing games that have... Uh, stood the test of time and that we as a group and by we I mean the people who regularly and semi-regularly appear on this podcast agreed were excellent excellent games at least 10 years old I'll get into more details about how that works later but we're going to honor these games called the masterpieces I'll do something written on the website as well uh, over the next couple of days and then finally this is going to be kicking off our fundraising week, trying to get more people to join our community on the Patreon, uh, spread the word about the Thoughtful Gamer, and kind of solidify what I'm doing. So that'll be ongoing this week. This podcast will be kicking that off. So we've got a lot going on. How we're going to do this is we'll stagger everything. So we're going to answer some questions, and then we will talk about a Masterpiece game, and then we'll answer some other questions, and then we'll talk about a fundraising thing and go back and forth and all around doing fun stuff like that. Chaos. I mean, you could say chaos, but this is one of the most organized notes I've ever had for a podcast, so it's 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 I maybe do. less chaotic <laughs> than we've ever been. Throwback to our chaos episode that everyone says we were horribly wrong about. <laughs> But it was fun. I've, I've gotten a lot fun. of good. I got a lot of good feedback about that episode. I think oh, mostly people said I was wrong. Oh, okay. <laughs> that makes me feel even better about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but just before we get into the first Q and A question, because this is kicking off fundraising week, or I, it's the best name for it, I guess it's, it's straightforward. It's what I'm doing. I'm going to be talking about some things I'm going to be offering to publishers slash designers. But for regular listeners like you, how can you help the thoughtful gamer? Uh, obviously, we have our Patreon. I would love to get more people in on that. I'm going to be fiddling with a couple of things, a couple of goals for the Patreon that should be very fun. Uh, you can also help with coffee, ko-fi. Uh, there's a link there on the website, on my Twitter bio. Uh, if you just want to do a one-time donation to the Thoughtful Gamer, but don't want to commit to something uh, monthly. And it's always appreciated and helpful and super great if you can like, share, subscribe. I know that's cliche nowadays, but all that kind of stuff on social media. I love seeing comments to the post, that kind of thing. Engagement, as they say, is super helpful if you cannot contribute monetarily. So anything like that will help the Thoughtful Gamer. But if you are a designer slash publisher, someone in the board game industry, I'll have a couple of news things I will be announcing later on. But let's get to the first Q&A question. If there was one board game you could have banned right now, what would it be? Do we want to ban any board games? I'm, I'm typically against banning things. Yeah, I, I'm I'm a very pro-freedom kind of person. Can I ban Gloomhaven? But why? <laughs> but why? <laughs> All right, so, so I actually have a reason here. I, I Wait, I thought like, you liked Gloomhaven. I, I do. I actually, I very much do. I don't own a copy so that's that's one negative about it and even if i did own a copy i probably wouldn't have like a group that could consistently play with me for those of you that don't know i'm down in connecticut while 
the rest of this group group is up in Boston. So I don't get to play with them all that often. But I, I bought the online version of Gloomhaven, which is it's good. It's still in like a, a beta phase. But the main reason I even mention it is I feel like it's getting other games or it's overshadowing other games just with like I feel like it's a permanent hype around it. And especially with the new one coming out soon. I don't know. I, I just feel like it's it's had its run. I'm good. Ban it. <laughs> <laughs> what are some other games that you think have been have been overshadowed that are worth checking out? Oh, I, I'm not even like I, I'm just saying like in general. OK, I, it's I, like, I feel like other games game could have a in better the board game world. Correct. Yeah, that makes sense. The only All game right. the only game that came to mind for me for banning not that I would actually support banning it, but the most distasteful game I've ever seen was one that someone wanted to send a re- they offered to send me a review copy, and it was a take that card game about giving your opponents STDs. Okay. And yeah, that one no that one made that me upset. Exist. No good reason, at least. That that should not <laughs> exist. Oh, jeez. <laughs> okay, my answer is just pure curmudgeon. Blood on the clock tower. <laughs> because people are excited about it, and they're wrong, and so we should ban it. <laughs> I, I don't know how... I think the excitement's kind of fizzled out on that. I think I think yeah, a I lot know. of people have seen the light that it's it's not that great. Yeah, I don't actually believe that, and I think you can probably have a fine time with it, but... Oh, I bet if you had a dedicated group and you really set the mood and you had people who really knew what was going on, I, I'm sure it's a great time. It's just yeah. a lot of buy-in to get to that point. Yeah. Orion, you want to ban Stevenson's Rocket with me? <laughs> sure. <laughs> oh just man, let's not Mark. even <laughs> let's not even go there. <laughs> oh man. No, I don't know. I don't have a good answer to this. I'm trying to think. Is there a game that I just despise the fact that it exists <laughs> i'm trying to think of what the most or it's like a game that makes the world worse or something i don't know um, mark mark you had the best answer let's just go with that i mean there are a number of bad looking social party card games that i have been offered uh but nothing close to that that one was truly gross oh i have a good one. Oh, i'm i'm sick of cards against humanity there's yeah. like so so many better or or even like apples to apples. There's so many better versions of that game that I feel like we can ban the original. Yeah, we can be done with it. Yeah, it's just gone. I mean, it's kind of personally banned for me. I have no desire to play any unless someone brings something out in that style with a truly unique twist. I yeah. uh I don't really care about playing any of that style of game. All right. Going completely the opposite direction into games that we think are incredible. The idea with the Masterpiece games is that we would select up to five games a year. And we have five that we selected. The criteria were that the game would have to be at least 10 years old. It's just an arbitrary cutoff time I picked just to get it past kind of the the current hotness discussions. The idea would be that it is games where we appreciate the design. It's not necessarily games that we want to play all the time or want to play right now, but games that we can look at slightly more in an academic sense and say, okay, this is really, truly something great. Because when I do my reviews and my ratings, it's largely, those ratings are largely in terms of how excited I am to play the game. But there are games that I'm not necessarily excited to play very often, but I still can appreciate so this is more of of a note of appreciation of the game rather than how fun do i think this game is right now so it's designed to be a recognition uh that's long term that's about games that have been or that have withstood the test of time that we can step back and say okay these are something truly truly great in our definitions we kind of had like important to and in these were kind of loose and somewhat subjective but we had a like a top game which was what I considered to be like top in its category or design lineage or something. And then important to a certain 
type of game. And then the other one, which we took a couple different ways, was kind of more like should be played more or something like that, right? Yeah, I mean, it was a way to narrow down the list and then see different perspectives on it. So this is also factoring in somewhat the importance of the game in our short gaming history in terms of influencing other games. But it's not just about that. It's not just about how how fun we find that game right now. I think I, I keep going back to the word appreciation. That's what I really wanted to highlight. And it's how I kind of guided it. Although everyone and everyone who was, who was in this yeah. podcast was part of that selection uh, process, you know, was able to take that info as they wished. I didn't want to yeah, narrow Martin, it think, too specifically. I, I think that's right on. I think appreciation is is kind of the key here. These are games... As I look through this list, it's absolutely true. I just have a great appreciation for the design or or, or some aspect of of uh, what these games are. Uh, like you said, not every one is a game that I now today in 2020 want to play above anything else. But a sense of timelessness. We're not trying to be overly objective here. These are these are games that demand appreciation. The way I see it too is like we've said this three times now, in, in that like we may not always want to play these games, but each each of these games is a game I would be not surprised if someone else had not played it, but I would want to introduce this game to someone who may not have played it. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so if someone approaches me that's a gamer and hasn't played one of these games i immediately get excited and want to teach them this game because of its whatever you want to call it because of the fact that it's a masterpiece (laughs) yeah and i don't expect that to change in the next 10 years for any of these right it's an attempt to get away from the excitement of the now and and look at the games that are we think are truly truly great and will continue to be so Let's introduce our first masterpiece game. You have certainly, if you've been listening to the podcast or read The Thoughtful Gamer, you have heard us go on about how great this game is, and that is The Resistance, a game that we have played so much that we actually kind of got tired of playing it and then haven't played it in a while. But the memories of playing The Resistance week in and week out for over a year at least and in different contexts for me, it is one of the best gaming memories of my life. I think it's it's nearly perfect game, as much as you could say something is perfect. I mean, Masterpiece, the best social deduction game ever. <laughs> yeah. And there's a reason it's on the top of this list, and it's a reason it's been in all of our top tens at some point, and might still be in some of our top tens, and... We played it, what, 50 times or 100 least, times over yeah. the course of a couple of years? And it's still iconic in our group. And those memories will, I mean, those are still things that we talk about. It takes that genre of social deduction and strips out almost all of the fluff, just down to the minimal setting and just enough information for you to, to draw some some conclusions and never really know if you're right until maybe it's too late and it plays differently at five through 10. So, yeah, I think the elegance of the resistance is really how every other social deduction game I look at ends up in my mind. I compare it to the resistance because I don't think you can get more simple than the resistance and have an enjoyable game. It's really kind of the distilled essence of social deduction any other social deduction game is going to owe some kind of debt, I think, to the Resistance. I think more than uh, almost any other game, the Resistance has a kind of before and after feel of like, it it just so defined its genre of game. Before the Resistance, there was Mafia or, I don't know, some other social deduction. Then we got the Resistance and everything since has been judged uh, to its standard one thing that I don't think was mentioned, the Resistance gave me the purest metagame experience that I've ever had in a, in a board game. And I think it, it stems from how elegant the game is. Um, but just playing with a group over time, seeing how the game evolved and evolved over 50 to 100 plays before it got stale. 
and it did get stale for us, but I've had the same experience with other groups of people where uh, there's just, just amazing, uh, evolving meta game. I remember not being able to sleep after we played the resistance, thinking through every game, like recapping every moment of every game in my mind, trying to think, could I have subverted the meta here? Or could I have lied differently here? Or could I have, you know, what if I did this? Or what if I did that? And I've never had that with any other game. So that's our first masterpiece game out of five, The Resistance. Let's move on to the next Q&A question, which is, what are your guilty pleasure games? Games that you know are bad or just okay, but you like anyways, and why? I've got a... I've got to mention Betrayal on House on the Hill. Or oh, it's it. so away. bad. <laughs> it's such a bad game. We've talked about this at length before. I have fun I think... every time I play it, but it's such a bad game. <laughs> it's so That's... contrary. I don't understand. <laughs> like like 20% of the time it works every time. You just, you just give an hour to the game and then maybe it'll be fun. And then when it is, it's really fun. And most of the time, it's it's kind of like a deflating balloon. It's always fun. It's 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 always a disappointment in some way, but it's (laughs) always fun. (laughs) Yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, I think Matt, this is the one that came to mind when I saw this question too. Is this the one you all (laughs) thought of? I actually I completely forgot about this game because I haven't played it in such a long time. I mean, I. And I think we've had this discussion before in reference to movies. I don't quite understand the idea of a guilty pleasure as a concept because anything I can I enjoy, I can explain in some sense why I enjoy that thing. So the idea of something that you enjoy that is like unexplainable, I don't know. I don't get it. I don't it's know. Not Betrayal's so... pretty unexplainable. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, I don't really enjoy that game. I think I gave it like a four and a half out of ten or a five and a half or something like that. Like, I don't think it's very good. I think it's wildly uneven and occasionally quite fun, but most of the time not fun. I think the the game that came to mind for me, and it's not because it's not a generally respected game or a game that I think is poorly designed, but just a game that doesn't fit in really with the other games that I enjoy in that it's, it's light and breezy and kind of, I don't know. It's something I would in any other context, I would probably dismissed as being kind of not enough tough decisions or, uh, not enough to think about or not particularly interesting, but I just enjoy it, and that's Tokaido. Yeah, that, that seems like your guilty pleasure, Mark. <laughs> that that might be, because I have a hard time explaining why I enjoy it, and it's not that I get a sense of serenity. I just find that even though the choices are limited and they're simple, I find them enjoyable. You know, okay, okay, I want to say one thing. It's not that I can't explain why I have a good time playing Betrayal at the House on the Hill. It's that the ways that I typically think about and critique board games, by every single one of those heuristics, it's an awful game. And so, like, the reasons that I'm left that I have fun with it are are completely outside of the, the normal board game world that I live in. Yeah, that, that's that might be actually a good definition of a guilty pleasure game. Then, yeah. Any I for you, to... Bubba? Anything with a tech tree? Oh uh, yeah, you love tech trees, huh? I I love tech trees. So like, I always so get like ex- a bad a bad to mediocre Civ King. <laughs> Absolutely. Have you <laughs> played Bubba? Progress the evolution of technology. I have not. Oh boy, it's I've been trying to get tree. rid of this game, <laughs> and I'm going to offload it on you. <laughs> it is a completely mediocre game that's literally entirely tech trees. Huh. <laughs> I love I, I don't know why, but I just I love the feeling of progress and tech trees. I remember playing some Civ game with you in college, Bubba. Yeah, Civilization just, the board game. And I just felt so bad because I couldn't figure out the the tech tree or I felt like I didn't understand the tech tree enough 
and you're over there just relishing every bit of it. <laughs> I don't know. I, I literally cannot explain why I like them other than like, I like progress or I guess engine building. Uh, but like not all tech trees even have engine build. I, I don't know. My favorite part of TI always is the tech tree. Always. That makes sense. All right, let's move on to the next thing, which is a new opportunity for board game publishers, designers, or even just anyone in the board game industry who might want to advertise slash sponsor with the Thoughtful Gamer podcast. Yes, I am looking for sponsors, uh, people who want to run ads. I'll do normal competitive rates, whatever it tells me online. So if you're looking for that kind of thing, go ahead and contact me and uh, we can work something out. I'm excited to do that, earn a bit more money. And I really, really want to try to have board game companies be doing this rather than like this five random tech companies that sponsor every podcast on earth because I like ads that people might actually find interesting. So if you are a board game company or work for a board game company and uh, want to know more, go to thethoughtfulgamer.com. You'll find the contact page there and you can contact me there if that is something that interests you. Next question. What were your first board game crushes? Not the game that got you into the hobby per se, but the one that really got you excited about gaming. This may be a similar answer for all of us, I'm suspecting. I actually have what I suspect is a different answer. And for me, it was a combination of Risk and Axis and Allies, which I played in high school and just absolutely loved the games and loved the war stories and the history and the strategy and the maps. And, and now I look back and be like, eh, those games were, you know, overshadowed at least by other things especially other war games that I've come to enjoy. But I spent so many hours playing those back in the day. I remember one time it was a snow day and my friend came over and we invented a whole new set of rules for risk. And I think we spent like 30 minutes actually playing them and like the previous five hours coming up with rules and tweaking them and whatever. And it was a blast. Mine is uh, Redemption, the collectible card game. Oh, yeah, uh, I forgot about that. Yeah, I played this collectible card game quite competitively all throughout middle school and high school and, like, made it to nationals and everything. Like I said, it, it's a tiny, tiny Christian card game. It's a little bit like Magic the Gathering, t totally different premise. Some really cool ideas and concepts within the game, but at this point, it's pretty broken. I don't even know if it exists anymore, but... Uh, that's what got me into gaming, and that and maybe Stratego played that at home all the time throughout high school. So, Mark, I, I bet we have the same. I'm going to say Dominion. Yeah, um, I mean, it's I, very hard for me not to say Dominion. Because when I, when I read the question, like, board game crush, like, Dominion was the first game that, like, I, really, I, I just really wanted to play. I'd think about in class and want to go back and spend time with dominion instead of doing other things that i probably should have been doing in college that's the first time i had that experience in the board game world dominion i, I it's really i really can't choose anything but dominion here because like it was the game that kind of got me into the hobby but it was also the game that really i got obsessed with quite easily especially when we were playing all the time online like that was there was a lot of Dominion going on. That was the game I really oh, yeah, fell I into. Yeah, about online. It, it, wasn't just, yeah. it wasn't just thinking about in class. It was playing in class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if there's any other game... Like, I played Catan before that. I didn't love it. I played Risk, and it was fine. There were various games I liked as a kid. Scattergories was a family favorite of ours. The only game, and it's not really a hobby game, but the only game that, you know, hobbyists this community might play that I really liked before Dominion would be Hearts, because uh, my dad played a lot, and, and he taught me how to play, and I enjoyed that, but not really a hobby game. It was really Dominion for me. And now we've got Lindsay popping in, joining the podcast here for the second half of it. Any any games for you that were that that were your first board game crushes that really got you going in board games? 
I mean, I, I guess I have to say the stereotypical Settlers of Catan, which I feel like is, you know, everyone's gateway drug into board games. My brother played that with me and his girlfriend at the time when I was like 13 or 14. And then from there, turned into Ticket to Ride. And then those kind of carried out through beginning of college and then Dominion. So I think, you know, like you were talking about before. But those all stand out to me as general gateway drugs of board games. All right, let's go to our second masterpiece game. And this is an epic one, kind of the prototypical epic game for us. And that is Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition, uh, only because 3rd Edition was the one that's that was at least 10 years old. Uh, I think we'd all prefer to play 4th Edition right now, but it's it's a fairly slim margin there. It's more for just UI reasons rather than the actual game, which I almost didn't put Twilight Imperium up for consideration, but that didn't seem quite fair. And the third edition, I think we would all agree, is even if the fourth edition didn't exist, third edition is is certainly warranted to be considered a masterpiece. Thoughts on Twilight Imperium? It's got a tech tree. (laughs) (laughs) It's almost the opposite side of the spectrum of the resistance. Twilight Imperium makes it because it was so ridiculous and huge and it just all works 100 percent. And you're left with just this incredible experience that spans most of a day. And it it just works. It, it, It really is the massive space opera that you kind of feel like is possible but so many games fall short of just being a hundred percent epic and ti does it i think i think one thing that twilight imperium gets not enough recognition for because it's this game that's been around for such a long time it's this giant epic sprawling game lots of plastic lots of bits and it takes a long time etc etc i don't think there's enough appreciation for actually how streamlined and straightforward the gameplay is. There are a lot of pieces and there will be cases during your games where you have to look up, you know, the order in which something resolves. But I mean, the large mechanical pieces of that, of that game are quite elegant, even though there are a lot of them. Like the whole strategy card thing is really nicely done. The way combat resolves is straightforward, similar to something like uh, access and allies before it the way politics works right you have these two resources one's for building one's for influence like that's just straightforward while i wouldn't say it's an elegant game i think a lot of the pieces of that game are very elegant something you don't necessarily see that much with big giant games that are coming out today well it creates its own history you know it's a board game that creates its own history and storyline and you have time for multiple ups and downs throughout a game so you don't die at the first setback. You don't you don't mess up your engine on the second turn and just kind of play catch up and lose. You have time to take a big hit and come back. And you get all this rich interplay and politics and backstory between the factions. I really love it. And I had great expansions, which made it even better. Indeed. Next Q&A question. What is one game that you would pick for your co-host that they have not tried, but you think or know that they would like? This is a good question. I think I have one for you, Matt, although I can't remember if you played it. Have you played Brass yet? I did play it once. Oh, okay. Well, then, not that one, then. (laughs) (laughs) Have you played Venus? No. Okay, I'm going to choose Venus for you. I think you would really like that game. I'm scared of Lacerda. (laughs) (laughs) I've only played um, the Galerist. I think is the only Lacerda game I've yeah. played. And it was good, but I also feel like I'd rather play that game another three times to really figure it out. <laughs> but well, I mean, I'd be down for that. An even more complicated Lacerda game. <laughs> have you guys played just one? No, I have not. All right, well, that's my pick. You've I just played, played that for the first time at uh, the Super Bowl party I went to. Yeah, I mean, that's like the hot, hot game party game of the last year. So I assume it was pretty good. Yeah, it almost feels like but if I were going to put all of the word party games on a spectrum of, of heavy to light, it's probably the lightest, but it's also just really good. Now I'm trying to think of something that Bubba hasn't played that he would like. Have you played Armada, Star Wars Armada? I have not. I bet you'd like that one quite a bit. Really? Yeah. Any reason? I don't know. Like I, 
I, I know the premise of it, and I just not really interested. Huh. Maybe you wouldn't. I don't know. I think you would appreciate the different builds you could make. I think you'd have a lot of fun uh, fleet building in Armada. All right. Yeah. And, and doing weird things with the spatial elements of the game. Yeah, I feel I feel you'd like it. Yeah. And ramming your ships into other people's ships. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I, I've played games with that free movement mechanic where, like, you just you measure movement because that, that's what Armada is, right? Like, you measure movement with a, a ruler almost, right? It's a custom component, but essentially. And for some reason, that doesn't do it for me. I don't like it just because it's there's like a, a level of ambivalence to the movement for me. And I, I just like hard and fast rules a lot more than I like that free flowing. I don't know. I think it matters less in Armada than perhaps more technical games. Not that I've played Warhammer, but I, I, I think like going down to the millimeter is far less important in Armada. Sure. Okay. Armada, you also have the concept of momentum, so your ships kind of keep mostly keep going the direction they're coming, and you can only turn so much. Oh, that's so cool. it's not just like I can move a meter from this point in any direction. Hmm. Yeah, it's like a gear shift thing. You can only slow down or speed up a certain amount, and you can only turn a certain amount based on your speed slash size of your ship. So, which is which is one of the coolest thematic aspects of that game. Because that they actually function like giant ships. Interesting. Oh, I have a good one for you, Mark. Oh, it's it's kind of cheating. A real good game of Eldritch Horror, because you've only <laughs> been exposed to bad versions of it. <laughs> We've got to do that next time we're together. You got to show me the best Eldritch Horror can be, and then I will render my ultimate judgment. All right. Because so far that game has greatly disappointed me. How many times have you played it? Like twice? I think twice, yeah. Okay. It's a lot of pressure, Bubba. I know. It is. <laughs> <laughs> I played one, one Night from Werewolf. I've played it. I have not okay. played it. Stinks. <laughs> <laughs> Don't play it, Mark. I think it's so fun. I like it much better than than like a normal, I don't know. I like the short gameplay of it. I'd be willing to give it a shot. I've heard good things. Five minutes and everyone gets to constantly change roles all the time so you're not stuck with whatever you have i think it's great my main problem with it is there's there's very little open table information to go on so you just have to be willing to take people at their word so so like in resistance there's oh it's absolutely true there's very little you can just find out from just being an observer I don't think that's true. Because the roles change so much in just like a one round game. To me, it's almost it's almost to the point where it's random. And that's why I don't like it. It's almost to the it's almost to the end of the win lose banana continuum. (laughs) Sure. That's 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 my that's my social deduction game measurement. On, I don't know what the what the other end of it is, but the <laughs> the extreme random guessing, pure psychology, end is the game win lose banana. Yeah, uh, it, it is almost to that point. Not quite, not quite, but almost. All right, let's go on to the next opportunity for board game publishers, designers, and that is I'm going to be offering voiceover services. For whatever you need voiceovers for, I'm assuming most of that's going to be Kickstarter videos, which people typically have some kind of animated thing with some voiceover. I have done voiceover work professionally a little bit in the past when I was doing random freelance stuff, and I have done one Kickstarter video uh, so far, and you can hear my voice right now and decide if you like it or not. Um, I also teach speech, and I'm trained in speech and debate, so I know basics there. And again, my rates will be based on kind of typical rate sheets that I look up. So if you are interested in having a Kickstarter video that you want a voiceover for or something similar like to that, I will be offering that service going forward. 
Next Q&A question. This one is specifically for Lindsay because at one point when I was asking for Q&A questions, I just mentioned that Lindsay's a baker and maybe people had baking questions. So there was a baking question and this one seems like a doozy. The question is, tips or favorite recipes for gluten-free baking? As an added complexity, gluten-free baking for a diabetic. So we try our best to keep the carb count as low as possible. Is 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 it possible? <laughs> so it is possible, but that yeah, that's definitely very difficult because usually, you know, when you're going without one thing, um, you're able to kind of compensate using something else. And so when you kind of take away two separate, very important parts of baking in one, it's kind of hard to to do so since sugar and flour are just two giant scientific components of how baked goods just physically function. So, you know, eliminating and replacing both at the same time is definitely a challenge, but it is possible. You could just like eat a steak. You could just use steak. <laughs> not quantify, qualify as dessert. But if you like to have steak for your dessert, I can see that that that's a thing. <laughs> I mean, um, you can, you can bake a steak, right? That's gluten free baking. I don't think it's nearly as enjoyable, but that would be gluten free baking. You could probably do some sort of cheesecake, right? So cheesecake, yeah, you could do that. You just not have to do a graham cracker crust and do some sort of you know other other type crust, but that that would be easy enough. Almond flour is kind of my go-to for gluten-free baking. I don't actually really like, there's a lot of like substitute gluten-free flours that are like you're supposed to be able to use as like a direct replacement for flour, but it doesn't really work that way. So that's just not how flour works. So I oftentimes just go for like an almond flour or like a coconut flour or an oat flour or something like that. Um, and that's what I would probably make the crust out of. But the cheesecake, the hard part is that Whenever you're replacing sugar with an alternative sugar, other fun things happen with your stomach when you're using like different kinds of sugars. So you kind of, um, you may give up upsetting yourself in one way, but you trade in upsetting yourself in another way. I don't know how to gracefully talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have some idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, my general recommendation for just gluten-free baking in general is to find a recipe that's like already naturally gluten-free and make that rather than try to like sub out 12 ingredients to try to make something that you really love because I find that you just end up getting disappointed with it not resulting in what you want it to be. Cool. And then almond flour is going to be your best friend there? Almond flour will be your best friend because a lot of recipes just naturally... A lot of like good recipes just already use almond flour instead of regular flour. But yeah, I like um, almond flour as my alt alternate. All right, there you go. Baking advice with Lindsay. There you go. Totally related to board game. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now we have the next masterpiece game, the third one we are introducing. This one, I think, more so than the others because of the immense influence it's had on the hobby. Not that we think it's a bad game, but it is undoubtedly monumentally influential. And that is Magic the Gathering. And I think I okay, would have... Okay, wait, quick, quick question. Yes. How many of you are actually playing Magic right now? Uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> I was I playing have... about two hours ago. I do have a spreadsheet up on my second monitor, but I'm not playing. <laughs> okay. You were talking about playing that. Or no, that was that was Bubba. Never mind. Nope, okay. That was me. There yeah. you go. Yeah. So we've got like, what do you, you, you count as half that? So we'll say like 30% of this podcast is playing Magic right now. Sure. Yeah, we'll say <laughs> that. I mean, the online implementation is wonderful. I think a year or two ago, I might have really fought the inclusion of this game on the list. But as I've played it more, I've realized how much, not only it's just a fun game, but how m much thought and development and work goes into each of the sets they produce. And really the level of polish on what Magic the Gathering is producing, what, quarterly, is at just the highest level of, of game development and understanding of mechanisms and understanding of how to 
balance a set and make it fun and make it thematic and all of that. Like, I mean, obviously they have more resources than pretty much any game publisher in existence, but they seem to put those resources to very good use and, and what they're producing is, is pretty extraordinary. Yeah. The, the influence really, I don't think can be overstated. You know, one thing that, that we've talked about before is just the connections to dominion, a game that we love so much, but as I play magic, the gathering, I sometimes I'll just, I'll find other little interactions that I'm like, that's a really fun interaction that actually has like a really elegant mechanic underlying uh, the, the interaction. And it'll be something that has obviously been copied by dominion or some other game. And just as a game system, like you said, Mark, every set that comes out four times a year really is a different game in and of itself. And and you can combine the sets into different games that are like standard or eternal formats or casual formats like Commander. Like just the, the vast different ways that you can play that are supported by this incredible robust gaming system is something that it just really demands respect and it, and has been copied and has had incredible influence in the board game world i'm just gonna echo matt's thoughts more specifically in just how they've figured out how to use these cards that they have to develop so many different game modes whether it be sealed or draft or Matt mentioned commander or, or even like pauper, it just the, the, and the communities developed half of them. Even you've got uh, what's it called when uh, people put together uh, uh, their own cube, you can draft your own cube or play other. There's multiple different ways to draft from your own cube. That's what's most astounding to me about it. Is not not just the new sets, but all the different ways that the community has come up with to manipulate these cards. It's almost like a deck of playing cards in a way at this point. I think that goes a lot into why we selected it. I mean, obviously, if we want to look at influence, right, we could have selected something like Cosmic Encounter, but I don't think really any of us enjoy Cosmic Encounter that much. Uh, even though Richard Garfield has said that that was the inspiration for magic. Like we mentioned before, this is not just about influence. It's also about how much we appreciate the game as a design. And I think just kind of the, the way magic is an institution and all the different designs and all the different ways to play and all the different ways the game supported is, is as much of it as, as just sitting down to play a game to me, and I, I think it's well deserving of, of this recognition. I, I also would like to point out that because it's kind of, I mean, in terms of hobby games, it is the game with the most robust competitive scene as far as I'm aware. And therefore, I think some of the best writing about game strategy is is due to Magic the Gathering. Um, and even the best, some of the best writing about game design is is because this game has become such an institution, and that that shouldn't be overlooked either. I mean, there's so much content that is just magic specific. Honestly, I listen to more magic podcasts than I do board gaming podcasts. Now, I'm a I'm a regular player of magic, but on the level of what you said, Mark, of strategy and design, there's constant interesting discussion being had on that. So circling back to my earlier point about draft, when I'm drafting magic, I, I just love how many levels the game is being played on because I can sit down and draft on arena for 20 minutes and feel like I had a really fun time where I, I was making interesting decisions. But there's the game that I'm playing. There's the draft, which made up the deck that I'm using to play that game. And then there's the metagame of what decks people are typically drafting. And, and so I have to understand that ecosystem. And, and then there's just kind of just the wider understanding of Magic as well. Any, anyway, it just that's really a unique thing. Just kind of how many levels the game can be played on, how many different ways. All right. Next question in our Q&A. How has your approach to gaming evolved over the past three years? 
I found this question interesting because it's not something I've thought of before about if my approach has changed. I think more than anything, I've kind of seen a lot more, so I'm more quick to notice or maybe not not necessarily become annoyed by it, but just notice and understand when a part of a game is just kind of a worse derivative of a, a different game. So just my general understanding of games has changed. I don't think my approach necessarily has changed that much over the last three years. Like my preferences in terms of what games I tend to enjoy, I think has remained fairly constant. I'm just maybe a bit more picky because I've seen more games. I guess that and I'm I'm now into train games, so that's a thing. I'd say I've made a concentrated effort to be better at satisficing and recognize when I'm taking a long time to play and just make a choice. Because I think I, especially when I'm playing a game for the first time, I'm trying to understand it, but I'm not trying to play perfectly. And I value keeping the game moving more than finding the optimum move in any given situation, I think. Oh, I will say that I have prided myself on becoming pretty good at learning games very quickly from their rule books. Just from, especially our, our times at conventions and stuff where we're just like finding games and playing them. I really enjoy kind of mm-hmm. blasting through rule books and getting the game going as quickly as possible. That's a fun game in and of itself. Yeah, I'll say that that has uh, directly benefited the shift in my gaming approach. I think over the last three years, I've just come to enjoy learning a game more to the point where I, I'm okay that I uh, like I like going to a convention and playing a bunch of games that I'll only play once. That's just kind of a little bit of a shift in, in just enjoying that process. Playing a game to try to understand what it's trying to do. I'm not going to master it in one play, but it's fun to to just experience and see what it has to offer. And it's even better when uh, Mark's there to learn the game and teach you, so you don't have to read the rule book. Yeah, I only make I only make critical errors every once in a while, but usually we're, we're pretty good at sniffing out when something feels very wrong. We'll be like, okay, something's clearly not happening correctly here, and then I'll try to dig through and find the problem. All right, our final new opportunity for publishers and designers, people in the board game industry. And this is what I'm calling the final look. And what I'm offering is not necessarily rulebook editing, because I don't think that's where my skills lie. Not not like full service rulebook editing. There's a lot of people who have established themselves in doing that. And I think they do a fantastic job and more people should utilize them. But if you're a smaller publisher, maybe you have a smaller budget, maybe you think you've done a good enough job on the rulebook, what I am offering is a relatively inexpensive final overview, look at the rulebook, find those persnickety mistakes that you've overlooked, have a fresh pair of eyes looking at your rulebook, And then either make those quick edits and suggest changes to make the rulebook read better, be more grammatically precise, have information where it should have those kind of last touches to a rulebook just to make them that much better. Or if I truly honestly think that the rulebook needs to be revised and really gone over in depth, I will recommend that you uh, find one of those great people who do full-service rulebook editing. But I'd like to offer a final look at your rulebook because I think that's something that I am I would be better at rather than the whole in-depth process. And it's something I've done before. I did this for uh, Soaring Rhino Games for their game Pirate Tricks and made some key changes to their rulebook before it went out to print, and I think they were pretty satisfied with that. So that is the third and final new opportunity service I will be offering to game publishers. So if you, again, are interested in that, I'll have something up on the website. You can contact me. All that's on at thethoughtfulgamer.com. Next question. 
Uh, the question is, it sounds like you've been playing with a group of friends for a while. If slash when there is a new friend who shows interest, do you have a game progression? Is there a series of games that we send people through to, to understand us? And I think the answer to that is pretty much no, not really. Yeah, it's a good question. But I think I think the way we feel about games is that any game, if it's a good game, will do. Like, we, we, we say this about quote-unquote gateway games. You don't have to start with one of a couple games. And I think it's the same when we bring people into our board gaming crew. Yeah, um, I mean, I've... It, I've brought people over to play games and you know if there was a game that was interesting me and i thought they might like it and it was a heavier game i'd be like okay this is going to be a two to three hour game and it's going to be fairly complicated but you know you you indicated you had some interest in this in this idea are you down with learning something that's going to make your brain think a bit and if they are we'll do that if not we'll find something else yeah i think personally i really do not like the phrase gateway game i think for one, it establishes this idea that you need to start people out with lighter games, and that's not necessarily true at all. And also, I think it kind of diminishes the games that are included among the gateway games, because it's assumed, okay, these are like lesser games, but once you play them and you move on to other games, you can kind of discard them and throw them aside, which isn't necessarily true. Like, I think Carcassonne is a fantastic game. It's considered a gateway game, but I think it's a really awesome game and maybe if we got rid of this language of gateway games we will introduce people to perhaps better games if we just think about how good the game is not necessarily forcing people to play lighter games when it's not really necessary yeah and i mean it, the fact gateway games a little bit earlier in the podcast we'll pretend that that never happened <laughs> no i mean it, it's fine it's just a, it's something I'm i'm disliking more and more there's nothing wrong with saying gateway games. It's a common phrase. But in other words, I don't think I'm winning this language battle, but I'll I'll shake my cane at it every once in a while. So I don't think the question is like limited to people who are completely fresh to the gaming world. I mean, even with maybe experienced gamers who haven't played with us before, I don't feel like we we have to play this game or that game. It, it's really, we're excited about games and whatever we're excited about, if they're excited about it, we're going to play. I think sometimes playing with a new person will reignite like a love of an old game. So like Battlestar Galactica is one that I think we bring out when we're playing with new people more or uh, the resistance to a lesser extent. We, we, we just love games. So like, I, I don't think there is a progression. And honestly, I'm a big, I'm becoming a bigger and bigger a fan of like determining what games you're planning to play before the meetup happens. Like the awkward, like oh, what should we play now? Thing doesn't need to happen if you're like, okay, I'm interested in playing in this game. Do people are interested? Are people interested in playing this one? And if they're not, we'll find something else beforehand. So when I came to Boston after being gone for like a few years living in Michigan, I think the first game we played together was Gloomhaven. So I don't know if that speaks to that as all at all. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't like your first modern game, but we were excited about Gloomhaven and we pulled you in. And now it's like literally your standard for rating games. We'll play a new game. It's like, okay, it Lindsay, how many Gloomhavens out of 10 Gloomhavens was that? Very, very true. <laughs> I mean, you have a you have a Gloomhaven reference uh, tattoo, right? Yeah, that is very true. I have a Settlers of Catan and a Gloomhaven tattoo. It's fact, factual. True facts. I initially read this question as uh, if slash when a new person joins your group, how has your gaming changed or something like that? And I was going to say that mostly we kind of just play whatever. Although since Lindsay's been around in the last few years. I think we probably play a few more party games just because she tends to stump for those. And we enjoy those just as much as other games. But just looking at the way kind of our gaming selection is shaped by who's a part of it. I, that's where my mind went when I misread this question. So for whatever yeah. that's worth. I think Ben's been pushing for more light party games also. I think that's sometimes because he gets uncomfortable sitting for a long period of time. Yeah, he's got back troubles, sadly. All right, let's move on to our fourth masterpiece game. 
We've already mentioned this one before, created its own genre, Dominion. Uh, the game that, again, hooked me, hooked Matt, hooked probably Amber as well. Amber's nodding her head yes. Just an exquisite design. I was talking, someone tweeted a few days ago about finding Dominion overwhelming. They they kind of wanted to play but didn't really know what to do. And so I was like, no, just honestly, just play the base game. It'll last you a very long time before you need to think about expansions like it it really holds up. I think there's this kind of narrative in the board game community that Dominion's a bit outdated now, but I could not disagree more. It's as fresh and exciting and as interesting as when we were playing it back in college. Yeah, and I love Dominion too. I mean, and if you're talking about games that got me into modern board gaming, it's basically Dominion at the same time as the rest of you. And I love this game, and I remember the pinnacle for me of Dominion was somewhere around sophomore year of college, sophomore, junior year, and we were playing online a ton at that point. And then that summer, Matt and I interned up in Boston, and we were playing two-player Dominion, you know, two or three times a week at lunch, if not more. And uh, we actually met people at the office who played Dominion at lunch. So we just found people and we were playing all the time. So it's a great game. It had that feeling of a game that you just, you get incrementally better and better. And I felt like, like I actually improved and I I could see the results of the experience of playing it over and over again. But at the same time, it's the kind of game where literally every game you play will be unique. You will never play the exact same game of Dominion. So it, it really is about understanding the particular setup, being able to take all that information and make it, make the best decisions. And it has, it has some randomness, which is very, like, I, I think it's good randomness. The order that you draw your cards from your deck keeps it fresh. But, but yeah, that summer was a highlight, you know, a top five gaming experience for me. But since then, as expansions come out, I, I have yet to be let down. And I think it is another instance of just an incredible gaming system. In a sense, Dominion is a gaming system. And as expansions have added cards to to the to the system, it does more and more interesting things. But it's just such a robust, elegant game at its heart. Does everybody have a favorite Dominion card? <laughs> I know yours. Is it still the same? It's been the I mean, same since it came out. Okay, then yes, I know yours. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> wishing well. No, it's not wishing well. It's that's not? His, that's oh, his favorite really one to that. say. <laughs> no, isn't isn't your favorite like goons or something mean like that? No, it is a little bit Cha- mean. Chapel? No, it's not chapel. Really, the best card, but anyway, it's minion. Minion. That's I, that's what I was thinking of. That one. That one has a lot of fun Is stuff. Is that the going one on. that's discard and draw four? Everybody discards their hand and draws four, and mm-hmm. you can either do that or gain two coin, and it gives you an action. Yeah, that's an annoying card. I can I can see why you like it. I think I don't know. I, I there's a lot of the newer expansion cards that I really like, but I haven't played with them quite as much. Uh, the one I always go to is Ambassador, just because it's. It's very good, and it's it's just solid, like, middle-of-the-road Dominion tempo, which is the way I like to play Dominion. Yeah, I've mentioned... This is really hard. I'm going to throw out the Mandarin. It's just a really interesting card, I think. It gives you three money, and then you draw a card, or you draw two cards, and then put a card back on your deck. It's just... Uh, I, I just find it really interesting because it it kind of opens up different ways of planning for your next turn yeah i I don't know if that's really my favorite card but uh hinterlands is probably my favorite set from which it comes i also really like tunnel Ew. oh yeah which uh you can base like entire strategies around of of just trying to discard cards out of your hand and then you get free golds it's good stuff i feel like that card's only fun when there's like a non-optimal discard strategy because otherwise it's just pretty much broken like it, yeah it just kind of takes over games I, I don't know Bubba I was gonna say we recently had a discussion about in the context of magic about broken cards <laughs> and, and how <laughs> yes that's I, true 
Mark and I don't really like the language, but I will say there's something about trying to break some dynamic of a game that that Dominion, every time you see a new kingdom, every time you play a game of Dominion, you're thinking, what interaction can I break? And that, in a, in a sense, that's the core of the game is looking at a new kingdom and plotting out a strategy of, of what crazy interaction can I break and just get incredible value that, that is unseen at the onset. Yeah. And, and it works in Dominion because everyone has equal access to all the cards. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have so many moments of that I can remember of, of discovering those interactions and winning with like a, a crazy, you know, a non straightforward strategy with tunnel. I built a deck where I had two golems in a bunch of tunnels. Well, Gollum goes, you play Gollum, and then you go through your deck until you draw two action cards. So I just made sure that I didn't have two action cards. So I drew and discarded my entire deck every time I played one. <laughs> and then you got like six golds. And, Go- yeah, Gollum and is I, a broke, <laughs> it's a stupid card. <laughs> yeah, and it's like, it's a stupid interaction. Gollum, you have to put the alternate money what are those called the potions potions yeah yeah and you have tunnels oh. which are victory cards gunking up your deck it was a stupid strategy but i got so much gold that it worked yeah that's pretty fantastic it, it, th- those sorts of things are just you know so it's such a fun experience all right moving on to the next cuny question what surrounding game equipment components do you like purchasing? For example, mats, sleeves, extra pawns or player markers, backpacks, laminators, 3D printers. What has enhanced the gaming and what ended up being something that didn't work out as initially thought? I don't know if any of us are particularly into blinging out games. That's a lie. Oh, do you bling? No, I don't, but... I, I do think that we can all agree on one asset that is very important to gaming. Wait, what? That's a that's a good gaming table. Oh, true. Yeah, the gaming table that Orion built is uh, is primo. I, I don't think you guys actually know this. My mom and dad, when I was growing up, have an old uh, wooden table made of oak that has been around since like the late 1800s. And it's narrower than most like normal kitchen tables, mm-hmm. but it still has like leaves in it. So it can act as a kitchen table, but it's really narrow and it makes it, it's like the perfect table for setting up like a, a regular size, like monopoly type size board game on. And like you can still reach across the table and like without having to stand up. I don't know. I stole it from my mom and dad and it's in my house now. But like it's <laughs> it's one of my favorite things just like cuz I want a table that's good for gaming. Yeah. And I don't think you need a gaming table necessarily. I think if you got like a big neoprene mat, that would enhance your gaming experience quite a bit, especially if you play a lot of games with cards, which is most games. The neoprene mat is uh is very nice. Other than that, though, like, I don't know, I've got a couple of wooden organizers. I've got one for Mage Knight, one for Battlestar Galactica, and one for Gloomhaven, which is honestly the only regret I have. I wish I'd brought bought the Broken Token one of Gloomhaven, and I brought a different brand. But I've, I've seen the Broken Token one, and it looks a lot better than the one I've got. Do we have anything else? Poker chips for 18xx games. That's that's a nice thing to have. I can't even remember to take my dice to magic events. I'm so bad with components. <laughs> um, so I think my answer is none. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I, I don't worry about anything extra. One of the guys we play trains with got these custom poker chips, and they're all these. Um, what are they? Have you seen the ones that George has? Maybe. Mark? Didn't he make a custom payout sheet too? Oh, those are uh, nice. Yeah, but th- that was a different guy. But they're like these, they're not grooved. They're almost, uh, I don't know, they're just like smooth, but almost the tiniest bit sandy. So you can like grab them and oh, nice. they rub together really nice and you can like flip them over and they, I don't know, they just, 
they're really nice poker chips and it's one of those like things that you decide to buy fancy poker chips because you use them in all the games as money instead of paper that i would never spend money on because that's just not who i am (laughs) but they're cool to play with they are nice yeah good good quality poker chips are nice when wes bought us the firefly board game he also got us a first player marker that's one of those plastic dinosaur toys (laughs) uh, which i've kept around uh (laughs) it's it's an egregiously large first player marker but yeah i don't think uh, compared to a lot of people i don't think we're particularly into blinking stuff out i mean and i think generally we're not really into we don't chase after minis games or stuff like that where i think i speak for all of us when i say we're more much more interested in very functional visual design or component design all right we've got the fifth and final masterpiece game that we are honoring for 2020 This is not necessarily what you'd call a hobby game, but it certainly is very important to gaming, and it's a design that we appreciate quite a bit, and that is chess. There was a bit of discussion about whether or not this should be included, because it's not really part, it's not like a designer game, it's not a hobby game, we don't know who designed chess, it's kind of a cultural artifact, but... I fought for it to remain because I think as a, even though we don't, we can't pinpoint a designer or a group of designers for the game as a design, I appreciate it a lot. I think everyone else does as well. And obviously it's significant. It's important, but man, like there was a while there for a few months, I was watching these chess streams with some of the top 10 greatest chess players in the world and it's an absolutely incredible game and the people who play it at the highest levels are doing stuff just beyond my mental comprehension it's a it's a beautiful game it's an elegant game and i and i think it's it's deserving of being called a masterpiece the immortal game oh yeah that's what they call it this was another game that i started playing when i was five or something and was in a chess club growing up and still play it now online almost every day trying to learn trying to get better and mostly failing but i love the the sort of thinking that it rewards that model of with no hidden information you're just you're looking at the same board and you're trying to out plan and out predict your opponent and see farther into the future. And I just love that. I, d- I don't know how to say it better than that. I read a chess book when I was growing up and it described the sort of mind. Oh, I'm going to forget the word. It was like live, I think. I think that, but it doesn't quite sound right in my head. It's like the, the supple and adaptive. Yeah, I think lithe is the right word for that. And just that, I don't know, that image just captured captured me at, you know, whatever, 20 some years ago. And that idea of that idea of predicting farther into the future and then studying some of the great chess masters and watching, you know, seeing analysis of their game and how they were predicting a dozen or even, you know, maybe 20 moves into the future is mind boggling to me and then watching these world championship streams and the analysis same thing with go when we watched the the alpha go you know a couple years ago and just the way they would analyze the patterns in the game is so incredible and i love the psychology of high level chess because it's just you and your opponent and you're basically locked in a glass box well not locked you know you can leave, but you're just, you're, you're not, you're not imprisoned there, but no one else is allowed in. It's just I don't know, you some of those your... old time Soviet players. Well, yeah. If they lost the match, they didn't want to go home, but that's another story. If you just, you're, you're in this room and it's just you versus the opponent and there's no hidden information. It's just, it's like wrestling or, or a martial art or something. You're just, you have to be better than them. And the rules are very well defined and there's no, you can't hide anything. You just have to be better than them. And I just, I, it's just like pure competition. And I really appreciate that. It's something really beautiful. Something I picked up when I was watching those streams and, and trying to learn a bit more about chess was 
how fascinating it is for such a simple game that it has such clearly defined phases to the game to where it's like, okay, we are, you can kind of pinpoint the, the space where it's like, okay, we're entering the mid game. Like we're leaving the opening moves. We're entering the mid game and they're like, okay, now we're in a late game situation and, and how the way that the players are thinking changes throughout those informal but kind of easily understood phases of the game which is not built into the design necessarily it's just kind of an organic part of that game that that emerges just from the basic rules all right we've got one final question for everyone and this one i found quite interesting so it's a longer question and it says are there guidelines or rules your group has for behavior both for someone new but also for the existing group like, how competitive are people supposed to be in games? How do you approach each other and take that games? Uh, how do you act in party games? What type of phone usage is allowed? Food? Player color choice? I mean, Ben always takes yellow. That's kind of his thing for player colors. I think we're pretty chill in terms of kind of the informal social rules. This is the perfect opportunity to bring up the game bubble. The bubble! The greatest gaming concept that Matt ever invented, I think. <laughs> I, I, Matt's greatest contribution to Western civilization. It, it might be. <laughs> I, I think I could. I can rest easy now. Yeah, no, I think that's that is one of the biggest things about our group is when we're playing a game, we are serious about it. We do play to win and play to do our best we expect others to do the same we're not mean about it like we'll help others to do well and get better but when we're in that game bubble like we're there to to game and then we step out of it and we're good to each other and we're we're friends outside the game bubble <laughs> yeah but we're not we're not super cutthroat necessarily like in terms of like yeah. taking back moves as long as no new information has been revealed we'll allow that which i yeah, think honestly should be kind of a standard among board gaming unless you're like at a yeah tournament situation like yeah if nothing new has been revealed let people take it back yeah for or sure. be even more lenient if it's like you're everyone's first time playing the game like let people have fun yeah i think bubba you were i forget who you i forget if it was you or jeff but one of you made the comment like the first time you came up and played ti we were way harder on you in terms of like letting you know if you were making a mistake or letting you take moves back or things like that because we've played with you so much and you're we're so used to you winning <laughs> <laughs> that's right it was your first time playing the game and we were <laughs> We were all we're scared. Like, sure, you can come attack my home system and get wiped out. <laughs> you know, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, I don't know if you remember, but uh, oh, I do. Rem I do remember. You, you ended you up. You all got very lenient on me after you wiped me out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we might have felt a little bad. <laughs> uh, that was like turn one. Too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just went straight after Orion. <laughs> I saw an opening. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but but I would say like um that's kind of like out of game conduct. I uh, I totally agree. Like we're not here to get people on technicalities. Uh, that's not what we find so rewarding about the board gaming hobby. But we are here to get everything we can out of what do board games have to offer. And and that's, you know, great strategic and tactical play. And I think we push each other to to play well. We we don't play games just kind of casually, you know, just inefficiently, like purposely not trying to do our best, that sort of thing. We really push each other to play well. Yeah, and we're all we're all kind of strategically minded. And we love drawing other people into that. I will say we're pretty lax about food. I mean we all trust each other to use napkins. It's not like it's we're like of the first time we played TI. <laughs> oh yeah, we've learned not to let Amber have glasses of wine next to her. 
when playing a game she gets excited about. It's a miracle that more beer hasn't been spilled on game cards and stuff. Yeah, well, we're all pretty careful with that kind of thing. Like, I hear about groups where, like, any kind of food that it would have any residue is just not allowed near the table. And, like, maybe, yeah, if you have some, like, super rare, valuable antique game or something, but, like, napkins exist... We're all adults. And we'll, we'll just like stop and eat wings and then go back to the game after we wash our hands. Yeah, items. like, I don't know. We or, always or, have snacks. Or you, you eat with one hand and you play with the other hand or you have a napkin. I don't know. It's yeah. not a big deal. What about phone usage? Do you guys ever get peeved on, on phones? I mean, I, I have my phone out quite a pressure. bit just because I'm taking pictures for social media. But like, if it's not your turn. I don't know. I, I think it's pretty easy to still have a phone available and not have that cause a delay in the game. Yeah, I think we're pretty chill about phone usage because I, I think we all do things on our phone. And part of it is just like we know each other so well. Like, I'm not offended if you're interested in, in something on your phone while we're playing a game. And I totally get that there are situations where attention given to online things is is really annoying but in general when we're playing games i you know i trust that people are engaged in the game and and it's fine if they want to you know look something up online yeah and for me i know sometimes i just need like when i know it's going to be a bit of downtime before my next turn and sometimes i just kind of know what i'm going to do in my next turn looking up something you know looking at twitter for a minute will like help clear my mind a bit <laughs> So especially if, if, if it's like a fairly intense, complicated game, if I can get to a point where like, okay, my next turn simple, I can check out for a second and give my brain a rest. It's more just like general conscientiousness. Like, are you mostly playing the game? <laughs> are you mostly paying attention to the game? Are you mostly a, a, aware and responsive to people? Yeah. It's, I don't know. it's just a standard of reasonableness. That's all. Yep. And I think our group is is pretty good about that. All right, that's all the questions we had and all of the information that we wanted to talk about. It was a lot of info, but it was super fun hanging out with you all and going over these questions and talking about these wonderful, amazing games. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for joining us for a bit of a party cast. Uh, I wasn't able to get Amber to <laughs> join in, although she did contribute some nods and the occasional out-of-earshot comment, I think. At least for the microphone. Just as a reminder for people listening, again, this is kicking off a bit of a fundraising week. We're going to have new content every single day for the next five days, including more uh, information and, and more write-ups about the Masterpiece Games, about all the information we talked about here in written form, as well as a write-up about uh, my approach to reviewing games. I do a bit of introspective thinking about that, about how I want to proceed as as someone who uh, reviews and writes about board games. And then uh, finally on Friday, we'll have a very special premiere of a new video thing that we'll be doing occasionally with The Thoughtful Gamer. So be on the lookout for that. Again, if you'd like to support us, you can do that on social media by sharing and talking about what you like about The Thoughtful Game or a podcast episode or an idea or a review. You can also support us by going to patreon.com slash the thoughtful gamer. Everything that I do on The Thoughtful Gamer will be posted on the main website. Uh, you can also rate and review this podcast on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. If you have any comments, leave them below or reach out to me on social media. I'm on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs>